we got you muted. Let's do that. There we go. Um, five, four, three. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. And I got to tell you, you are in for a treat this afternoon. My friend, astronaut Wendy Lawrence, she's going to tell you about her amazing career, uh, the many years that she pursued and persisted and became an astronaut. And I cannot wait for you to meet her and hear her story. Wendy, thank you so much for being here and take it away. Well, thank you, Janet, for the opportunity. This is a great way to break up uh, my day. I think like many of you who are participating, it gets a little challenging to tell one day apart from the other when we're spending <laughs> two more days at home and you kind of feel like you are truly living the Groundhog's Day movie. So this is really fun for me to have a chance to interact with all of you. So let me tell you a little bit about my astronaut story, which for astronauts who are around my age, meaning astronauts who got to grow up during the Apollo program, is not a story that's very unique because again, we got to grow up during the Apollo program. We got to sit in front of our televisions at home in July of 1969, like millions of people around the world and watch with our own eyes, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon for the first time. And again, for like a lot of astronauts around my age, we looked at that and we were absolutely amazed by what we were seeing. They were kind of jumping and shuffling along the surface of the moon and the moon looked so different than anything that we had seen down here on earth. And for most of us, that's the day we said, hmm, that really looks like a fun job to have. That's what I wanna do when I grow up. I wanna be an astronaut. I wanna have my chance to fly in space. So in July, 1969, I was 10 years old. I was growing up in Southern California, just north of San Diego. And no, I did not spend a lot of time thinking about how to make my astronaut dream come true. Nor did I also think about the fact that I hadn't seen anybody who looked exactly like me flying in space. I just had this dream. It wasn't really until I got to high school that I thought about, hmm, I still want to do this. How do I do this? Keep in mind back then, we did not have the internet. We did not have the Google. It wasn't really easy to do a lot of research. You had to go to the library and uh, resort to encyclopedias and other books. But my dad had given me some, had given me some advice that really wasn't all that complicated. Pretty simple advice, but in hindsight, really good advice, very powerful advice. He said, well, why don't you take a look at what people who got selected by NASA to be astronauts, what did they do before they became astronauts? Did they all go on to college? If so, what did they study there? What sort of things did they do after they graduated from college? Were they scientists, engineers? Did they go in the military? Did they learn how to fly? Well, a lot of the astronauts had gone into the military. They had learned how to fly. My mother's dad was a Navy pilot. He had gone to the Navy, Naval Academy. My dad, who actually was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, he went to the Naval Academy, learned how to fly. So like them, I said, well, I think I'll go to the Naval Academy. I studied engineering, graduated in four years, and then I learned how to be a pilot in the Navy. And I decided I wanted to fly helicopters because they're really, really fun. You can fly sideways, you can fly backwards. Oftentimes we just hover over one spot. And when you are a, a pilot in the United States Navy flying helicopters, sometimes you're like an Uber driver. Sometimes you're like Pizza Hut and Domino's and you deliver your FedEx as well. You move around a lot of cargo, you deliver food, you deliver mail. But more important, and one of the things I really enjoyed most about being this type of pilot, I was always part of a team. We usually had three or four people flying together on the helicopter, and it was our job to work together as teammates, to talk to one another, to challenge one another and say, really, do you think that's the best thing that we should be doing here? Do you think that's safe enough? Maybe we should try this. 
So together we would talk, we would communicate, we'd throw out ideas, jointly we'd decide what was the best thing to do so we could safely accomplish our mission. And those are all skills that you use as an astronaut because you're always part of a team, a crew, and your crew is part of a larger team. And it's very important that you can communicate well with one another and make good decisions to identify what problems might occur and come up with a plan to deal with that problem if in fact it does occur. So I was very happy that I got a lot of great experience in the United States Navy and eventually I submitted my application to NASA to be an astronaut because being an astronaut it's like any other job you actually have to apply. NASA doesn't seek you out you have to tell NASA that you're interested. So lo and behold, long ago in 1992, I got selected by NASA to be what was called an astronaut candidate. So there you can see me, the red box, looking much younger. So at that point in time, I knew I was one step closer to making that dream come true of flying in space. Still wasn't there yet. I had to wait a little bit longer, but at least I was at NASA and it was very fun because my class got to design a patch. All classes come up with a patch. So you may wonder why we called ourselves the hogs. It's because we had full intention of hogging all of the flight time on board the space shuttle. And we were the 14th group of astronauts. And we <laughs> happened to be selected 500 years after Columbus did his voyages of exploration. So you show up. You are an astronaut candidate. You are in training to become an astronaut. You basically have to go to astronaut school because nobody shows up having been an astronaut before. You gotta learn what that means. First and foremost, you have to learn the spaceship that you're gonna fly on. So you can see several pictures of us. We're in the simulator practicing all the procedures that we have to use to operate the space shuttle safely. You can see that we'll work together. Oftentimes it's two crew members who were assigned to work that procedure together. We sit in classrooms with our instructors. They're the experts on various systems. So they're teaching us what we need to do. And again, we go into the simulator and we practice. How are we gonna fly the robotic arm? How are we gonna do spacewalks? I bet each and every one of you have had an opportunity to at least hear the word virtual reality, if not use that technology. And NASA has actually been using that technology for ooh, about 20 years now to help astronauts prepare to do their spacewalks. So in the upper picture, you can see, this is Steve Robinson. He's got a VR helmet on his head. And actually inside that helmet, what he sees is a view of the outside of the International Space Station, a very, very large spacecraft. And if you're on the outside of the space station trying to do a spacewalk, one of the hardest things for you to figure out, since it is so big, is how you're gonna go from one work area to the next. There are lots of obstacles on the outside of the station, meaning pieces of equipment that are so big, it's hard for you to figure out how to move around them. So using virtual reality allows our astronauts to very quickly experiment with what path is going to be the best to take. So you can see he's got gloves on, cables lead back to that helmet. So as Steve was moving his hands around, the view inside that helmet changed in coordination with his hand motion. Usually we'll put a spacewalker on the end of a robotic arm. So that's another opportunity for our crew to learn how to talk to one another. So the virtual reality laboratory, the Johnson Space Center also has a way for you to simulate flying the robotic arm. So we have to figure out what up and down mean when we're in space. So if you have a spacewalker on the end of the arm and they say, take me up, I, you know, if you're the arm operator, oh, what does that mean? I don't feel gravity pulling on me anymore. So down can be whatever I want, up can be whatever I want. All that gets sorted out. Another thing you have to learn as an astronaut candidate is being the person inside that suit. Going into a big swimming pool at the Johnson Space Center, basically the world's biggest swimming pool, it holds 6.2 million gallons of water and it's called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. And it's called that because we use a physical principle of neutral buoyancy 
to simulate the feeling of being up in space, to be orbiting the planet in a state of free fall, no longer actually feeling the pull of gravity on you, even though your spaceship still very much is in the Earth's gravitational field. We wanna simulate what it's gonna feel like to be floating all the time, to not actually have gravity helping you as you try and position your body in a way that you're gonna be stable enough that you can carry out your activity. So if you've ever seen anybody go scuba diving or if you've done scuba diving yourself, you've actually utilized neutral buoyancy. Typically a scuba diver with those big air tanks on the back, they'll have to put a weight belt on to sink far enough down in the water and then be able to hold that position. And that's what we call neutral buoyancy. So we can do the, the same thing with a training version of the spacewalking suit. We can put the astronaut in it. We close the suit up. We have to blow up the suit like a balloon. It functions better that way and it keeps the body healthier if it's what we call pressurized. You start uh, putting air into the suit for the astronaut to breathe. That's the yellow hose you see in the lower picture. And then you actually, again, have to put weights on the suit, just like a scuba diver. So if you add enough weights, the suit literally sinks, floats in the middle of the water, and that's what we call neutral buoyancy. So now you're simulating what it's actually going to feel like to be in space. So Let me ask all... you a question. Yes. Had, had you been a diver before? Did you ever know astronauts that maybe weren't great swimmers and had to overcome maybe a bit of claustrophobia or their fear of water in this circumstance? So you are actually screened for claustrophobia. And right now that's not a, um, if that's a condition that you can't overcome, then NASA doesn't necessarily want to take you as an astronaut. As that's part of your astronaut candidate training flow, uh, you go through a swimming test. Some of that is for uh, what we call water survival training to fly in our T-38 jet trainers. So any military pilot's going to go through water survival training. We learn skills of, and part of that is learning how to be a better swimmer, learning to be more comfortable in the water. So you don't have to be the world's best swimmer to be an astronaut. NASA is going to help you learn how to swim better and, and feel more comfortable in the water. You also learn how to do scuba diving as part of your astronaut candidate training flow because when you eventually get assigned to a crew who may be doing a series of spacewalks, oftentimes it's very valuable for you to do a dive in that big swimming pool, the MBL, so you can watch the spacewalkers practice the tasks that they're doing. I did that several times on my last flight because I was gonna, I was the robotic arm operator and I was flying the spacewalkers on the end of the arm. So I wanted to get a chance to see what it was going to look like for them as they did the various activities so I could understand what they were saying that helped me be better at flying them around. So just because you're not a good swimmer right now or you're not necessarily comfortable, that doesn't mean you can't be an astronaut. It just may be that's one activity that you have to practice a little bit more and ask people to help you with it so you can start feeling a little bit more comfortable in the water. Excellent. Thank you. A couple of questions that have come in, and I'm sure that Dharma uh, and Jennifer are going to want to talk to you here at the minute. But A, did you ever meet Catherine Sullivan? And then B, what was your favorite part of training? Yes, I did meet Catherine Sullivan. And actually, I'll tell you a fun story. I hadn't met her yet. But when I put in my application to be an astronaut candidate, I was actually back at the United States Naval Academy teaching physics. And it just so happened there was another Naval officer stationed there. She had been in the Navy longer than I had, but she was good friends with Kathy Sullivan. And apparently Kathy Sullivan was keeping her advised of my progress through the selection process. And she let her know that, hey, Wendy's in the, is amongst the final list of um, candidates that were applicants that were considering. So I guess it was, that was kind of fun for me to kind of have a, get updates that other applicants weren't necessarily getting. So it was nice to actually meet Kathy Sullivan and thank her for being so considerate. Oh, uh, that is awesome. Uh, what was your favorite part of training? Did you have something that you enjoyed more than something else? I always like being in the simulators. 
You all are students, so you understand. Sometimes it's just hard to sit in the classroom and listen to the teacher or lecture on and on and on. It's more fun to do, to take what you've learned and actually try and practice it, to apply it. And so for us, that's what the simulator was. It was our opportunity to take everything we've been learning from our instructors in the classroom and actually practice it. And that it was the best way to figure out what did we really understand well, what didn't we understand as well, and we needed to get more instruction on. So I always like being in the simulators. And Wendy is may or may not brag on herself, but she was the first graduate from the Naval Academy to actually fly into space. So she has set some female. First, first female. Oh, yeah. Yeah, first yeah. female from the Naval Academy to fly into space. So I can understand why Kathy Sullivan was rooting for you. <laughs> yeah. So that's a good trivia question. Who was the first graduate of the United States Naval Academy to fly in space? Oh, I know Air Force more than I know Naval. And was that Hoot Gibson? No, it was Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard. I, you know what? It I got to put that up in, in space. <laughs> Oh, you know what? I did not know that. I'm going to write that one down. Yep, okay, we're getting ready to celebrate an anniversary of his flight, May 5th, 1961. So very fun. Anybody else want to ask me a question now? We'll just keep going. I, I don't mind you all asking me questions as we go along. That's more enjoyable for me. And that means that you won't forget your question and you get more information exactly when you want it. Yes, Jesse's question here in the chat is, did anyone ever get nauseous during the simulations or any of your training? Um, not so much in the simulators because they don't move around that much. Sometimes when we flew the T-38 training jets and we practice what are called aerobatics, you might get sick in that jet. And I will talk about that a little bit more about what happens to the human body when we go into space, because that's a very important question. There are changes that happen to the body and sometimes not having gravity can cause you to feel motion sickness. Perfect. Continue as you want. All right. So training as an astronaut candidate, that took about 14 months for me. And if you did all, I learned everything to the level that NASA wanted you to, and they were pleased with how you did, you got designated as an astronaut. For me, right before the end of my astronaut training flow, astronaut candidate training flow, I got assigned to a mission. So that was another about 14 months of training to keep learning the space shuttle, to keep learning each and every activity that we had to do during our mission. So let's see, it was about well, two and a half years after I got to NASA that I finally, finally, was ready for launch day. And here you can see a picture of one of my crews. We actually spend the last week on earth in quarantine. You can relate to that now. Think of uh, <laughs> staying at home during this coronavirus. We had to stay in the quarantine facility at the Kennedy Space Center. And then about four hours prior to launch, we got in our orange launch and entry suits, which we had nicknamed the pumpkin suits, and I think you can understand why we called them pumpkin suits. And is that Eileen Collins in the front with you? Yes, this was actually a picture from my last mission, so that is Eileen Collins. And then you drive out to the launch pad, and you've practiced all this before. About three weeks prior to liftoff, you've practiced a countdown, but on the real launch day, you get out there, the space shuttle, what you're looking at is all of that is known as the space shuttle. There was the orange external fuel tank, the two things that look like kind of candles on the side, solid rocket boosters, and the wing vehicle was called the orbiter. And on launch day, that fuel tank has fuel in it, and some of it's venting out the top, and the vehicle seems to be alive because it's kind of hissing and venting and groaning. And you're going to get go up 150 feet above the launch platform and get in the very small crew compartment and finally ride the rocket into space. So videos are always much more fun. So here you can see the launch countdown, seven seconds prior to liftoff, the three big main engines on the back of the shuttle orbiter. 
they were commanded to light off. They came up to full speed. Then the big solid rocket boosters on the side lit off. And you, the crew starts to bounce around, a lot of vibration. And about 30 seconds after we've launched, lift, left the launch pad, we're already experiencing what we call three Gs, three times the force of gravity. And it goes right through your chest. And I remember thinking on my first launch, oh my gosh, who just sat down on my chest? I can't breathe. Oh, it's so heavy. This rocket is so powerful. And I tried to put my arm out in front of me. I'm like, oh, that takes way too much effort. I don't have enough strength. And you just keep going faster and faster and faster. After about two minutes, the solid rocket boosters have used up all their fuel and they actually fell back into the ocean where we could pick them up and uh, repair them and reuse them on a later mission. And then eight and a half minutes later, you are up in space. And I like to show this picture because it's very similar to the view I had the first time I got to look out the window of my orbiter on my first flight, it was Endeavour. And I remember we were out over the ocean and the sun was shining on it. And you can see kind of those orange patches on the water. That's what we call sun glimp. You could see it with your own eyes. So you could see 3D, you could see the big thunderstorms, the towering clouds. And this is the moment when I finally realized, oh my gosh, I'm up in space. I did it. it took me 25 years, but my dream of being an astronaut and flying in space it's finally come true. And I thought to myself, if I don't get to look out the window again during the rest of the mission, this one view has made all of that hard work, the years of hard work, it's made it worth it. I'm living my dream. And I can tell you, it was so much better than I ever thought it was gonna be. It was an incredibly exciting moment, a very emotional moment as well. But if there's something you're thinking about doing and you have doubts about whether or not you can make it come true or whether it's worth it to work that hard. Trust me, it is. You at least owe it to yourself to try and make that dream come true. And honestly, if we could look out the window the whole time, we would do that, but we are up there to do work. And on my first flight, we got to do astronomy. We had three telescopes out in the payload bay and you can see a picture of our telescope. We were looking at very distant stars and galaxies. We were trying to see if we could detect any helium that might've been left over from the Big Bang to help prove that theory. And in fact, we did detect some of that helium. My next flight went up to the Russian space station Mir when it was on orbit. We had NASA astronauts living on board. That was kind of a, a program we used to get ready for the International Space Station. And that is the International Space Station. And that's where I went on my last mission. We did three spacewalks and we helped build a little bit of the space station and help fix some equipment that had broken. So, so that's Very where good. I'm going to ask a question we got from our Facebook page. Could you describe maybe the differences between the Mir and the ISS? And then there was another question about how many spacewalks you got to do in your career. Well, I can tell you right now, zero spacewalks. <laughs> I'm actually not quite big enough to fit in the spacewalking suit. I've been able to do the training in the MBL, but that was about it. I have actually put people in the spacewalking suit on my last mission. And then really the closest I've come is flying the spacewalkers on the end of the space station robotic arm, which was very fun. Differences between Mir and International Space Station, first and foremost, the size. But the design principles and the design approach, pretty similar, you, this is Mir, and you can see there are several modules that have been joined together. And kind of that central area where they're joined together, we call that a node, kind of a connecting module. And it has solar rays, because solar rays capture sunlight and convert it into electricity. So you have a lot of what we call systems on board to help keep the crew alive. You gotta have they have to have a way to generate oxygen for the crew to breathe and mix it with nitrogen to make air what we're used to breathing. You have to clean that air. As you know, we, we breathe in air, we exhale carbon dioxide. So you've got to remove that. Uh, you have to have a computer on board to monitor what's going on. You need to know where you are in space. You have to have a way to change the position of the spacecraft. So 
very, very complicated to design all of that. We learned from the Russians some, some of the best designs to use. And then here's the International Space Station. It's the size of an American football field. Kind of that backbone piece with the solar arrays attached to it, uh, that's called the truss structure. It's 338 feet long. So that means if we brought space station back down to earth, it would stretch from one end zone to the other of an American football field. But again, you can kind of see the same approach. We have several modules made by the Russians, made by NASA, made by the European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency as well. And most of those are laboratory models because we're using the space station to do scientific research because on the station, we can do something that we can't do on Earth. We can take away gravity and it stays away. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as you orbit the Earth, you are not feeling the pull of gravity. We can take away gravity for maybe 30 seconds at a time down here on Earth using things like a drop tower or what we call the zero G aircraft. But for scientists now on the station, you take away gravity. Gravity is the force down here on Earth that dominates everything we do. Everything we see around us, the main physical force that is acting is gravity. There are other forces at play, but we can't really see them very well because gravity is what dominates. So here's an example. Can you do this at home? Can you squeeze juice out of your juice pouch and have it float in the middle of the air? But on the space station, we can. That's water <laughs> we squeezed out of our drink bag. No gravity to pull it down to the floor. Because again, we don't feel the pull of gravity. Now it's the attraction of water molecules, one water molecule acting on another, that dominates. And so you get a big blob of water that floats until you either put your mouth around it, if your mouth is large enough to swallow it, you put your straw in the middle of it and suck it up, or you, I usually blot it up with a washcloth. So that again leads to some really interesting research. I bet everybody down here or participating, everybody here on earth has seen a candle, lit a candle. We know what the shape of a flame looks like. It's a teardrop. The hot air rises up around it and sculpts it into that teardrop shape. And you may not understand what the range of colors mean, however. The blue at the bottom of the flame means that's the cooler part of the flame. The hottest part of the flame is the top, and it tends to be why we call it a white hot, that color white hot, meaning it's the hottest part. So look at the picture right below the candle. That's what happens when you essentially light a candle in space, when you light something on fire up in space without gravity. So the shape is different. It tends just to be a round sphere of flame. And what's really surprised the scientists was the fact that the color of the flame from one edge to the other was now the same. It was blue all the way across. And a flame in space burns about a thousand degrees cooler than a flame on earth. And again, the scientists don't fully understand why this is happening. When you take away gravity, suddenly a flame in space will be cooler than a flame on Earth. But they do understand that there's an important application because when a flame burns at a cooler temperature, it doesn't create as many combustion products. So what does that mean? Think of that as pollution. So imagine you're the scientist that figures out why this happens. And then you can design an engine to burn at this cooler temperature and put it in your car. Your car would now not pollute the environment as much. So the good news for the astronauts who really like this experiment, and I got to do this on my third space shuttle mission. It's really cool to watch fire in space. This is very fun for them. This is one of their favorite experiments. They're gonna to get to do this again and again and again until the scientists finally figure out what's happening. So let me give you a quick picture, quick video Fire in space, fuel, we've ignited it. There you go. There is your blue ball of fire. So that's what fire looks like in space. Oftentimes, you all get to design the experiment. 
These series of pictures are a student design experiment that flew several years ago up to the International Space Station. Students wanted to know what would happen to caterpillars. What happens if we put the caterpillars up in space without gravity acting on them? Will they still do what they would do on Earth, which is build their cocoon and turn into butterflies? So if you go from the left to the right and the top and then down to the bottom, you'll see caterpillars are doing what caterpillars do. They're eating, they got bigger, they built their cocoon and lo and behold, they did turn into butterflies. Butterflies came back to Earth, they looked pretty normal, looked just like butterflies uh, on Earth had developed. But what was interesting to watch is the butterflies knew they were in a different environment. They could sense that they were already floating, that they were kind of already flying. So they didn't really flap their wings very much. They would move them around a little bit, but they knew they could get wherever they wanted to go just by kind of floating around. So it's really fascinating sometimes to take things that we're very used to on earth, we put them up in this different environment and they to see just how they're gonna behave. Wow, that is cool. Yep. All right, anybody have any questions about that? One question came in about the fire. Could like, is, could dynamite blow up in space or what would that do? Where is it inside my spaceship or outside? Ooh, good question, Jesse. <laughs> You know, uh, out in space, there's really not enough oxygen to sustain a fire. Inside my spaceship, there definitely is. We've had fires on board spaceships before. So that's a very, very dangerous a situation. Um, so yeah, we could, I could light dynamite inside my spaceship and it would blow up. Outside, I don't think I could actually even light the stick of dynamite because there's not going to be enough oxygen to sustain that fire. Sometimes, guys, what I will do is I will send you this questionnaire of things that you might need as survival things on the moon and see what you would and would not want to choose. I need to listen to everything Astronaut Wendy's told us. <laughs> All right, well. Here's one thing I'll let you in on. The doctors don't like to tell you that you, as an astronaut, when you fly on your mission, that you are also an experiment. As I said before, sometimes there are changes. Well, not sometimes. There are always changes that happen to the human body when we put it up into space away from its gravity, the level of gravity that it's used to. So the doctors want to study that. So that means for every astronaut who's on board the International Space Station right now, we're gonna take their blood, we're gonna take some of their spit, their saliva, we'll take some of their urine as well, and we're gonna monitor changes that happen to them. Because our astronauts on the space station, they could be up there for six months, they may be up there for nine months, they may be up there for almost a year. And so every month or so, they have to do what we call a fitness evaluation. And so we'll measure the air that they exhale, we'll record our heart rate. You can see a couple of our astronauts doing this fitness test with all the devices strapped on them, their blood pressure cuff, not very comfortable, but it's necessary for keeping them healthy. So one thing that happens, and we've really only become aware of this because we've had crew members spend months at a time on station, is that an astronaut's vision can change by being up in space. Down here on Earth, when you're standing, gravity keeps a lot of liquid down in your legs. But when we go up into space, and we don't feel that pull of gravity anymore, a lot of that liquid starts to move up into our chest cavity, and eventually it ends up in our head. And it literally can squeeze the shape of our eyeball. And that changes our vision. Things that we could read easily down on Earth without glasses, maybe we get up into space and suddenly that writing is blurry and we need glasses to be able to read it. For some astronauts, they've come back after their mission and the changes to their vision haven't gone away. They've become permanent. 
And that was very concerning to the doctors. And so that now for every astronaut who's up there, we have them take pictures of their eyeballs so the doctors can monitor some of these changes. That extra fluid up in their head, it tends to squeeze something called an optic nerve that attaches to the back of your eyeball. And that irritates the nerve. It, it gets bigger, it gets in what we call inflamed. And that also leads to some of the changes in vision. So as an astronaut, Karen Nyberg, she was using a very special camera to take a picture of her eyeball. And you can see what a picture of your eyeball impact looks like. And if you notice the little waves down kind of in the lower right hand pick corner of the eyeball, mm -hmm. that's because the eyeball is being squeezed. So we have to do regular eye exams for our crew members. We have to monitor changes to their bones and their muscles. Again, your body's not working against gravity. Your bones, your skeleton, when you get up on orbit, they immediately sense that gravity's not pulling on them anymore. And what gives your bones their strength is something called calcium. We lose calcium from our bones as soon as we get into space. And eventually that means our bones will get weaker. So you can see a picture kind of yellow with all the holes in it. That's what your bone, the inside of your bone looks like. There are actually little holes going through your bone and your blood vessels, small blood vessels run through them. If you're stuck in bed for a really, really long time, or as you get older, you lose that calcium from your bone. So the inside of your bone, you don't see as much of that structure. It's what we call osteoporosis. So that's the right-hand picture. Our astronauts can develop osteoporosis. Their bones can get very thin. And when your bones get thin, that means it's much easier to break them, to fracture them. And we're not exactly sure what would happen to an astronaut if they broke a major bone on orbit. The way bones heal themselves and stay healthy changes in space. It doesn't work the same way on Earth. So this is a situation we really, really want to avoid. But we have a way to kind of monitor that on orbit. We can use an ultrasound to see what your muscles look like and look with them you know, to get some idea of what your bones might look like. Did did you ever feel or even feel now that you had any long-term health effects because of your time as being an astronaut? My doctors at NASA have told me that so far so good. I'm kind of boring from a medical perspective, but again, <laughs> I've only spent a total of about 50 days in space. So take somebody like Christina Cook, who just came back from over uh, about 328 days in space. It'd be much more interesting to see to monitor her. Our gotcha. crew members go up there and they exercise six days a week. They usually spend about 45 minutes doing a form of aerobic exercise. You can see the exercise bike or run on a treadmill. They do weightlifting as well. So about an hour and a half a day, six days a week. That exercise thus far is keeping them pretty healthy, not much bone loss. But what will happen later in life? Don't know. And that's why the doctors continue to study astronauts, because we're not exactly sure if there'll be some long term effects that really aren't good for us. Did you have headaches or back aches? You do get a headache. Remember before I talked about that fluid? <laughs> you kind of feel like you have a head cold. Or if any of you have had sinus infections, your head gets stuffed up. You kind of feel like you have pressure behind your eyes. Um, as I said, your nose is stuffed up. The problem with having your nose stuffed up, you may not know this, but your ability to taste is linked to your ability to smell. So for us on orbit, our food tends to taste bland because we can't smell it and therefore we can't taste it as well. So we tend to like really spicy food so we can get some idea of what things taste like in space. Awesome. Well, speaking of food, would you all like to know what astronauts eat? Yes. And actually at this point, if I stop sharing, I can do an actual show and tell with you. First off, this is a crew of a space shuttle mission. They're in what was called the mid deck or the downstairs area of the crew compartment. And you can see they're in front of a small oven and kind of kitchen facility we had. Some of our food is what we call freeze dried. So we have to have a way to add water back in. So that round metal device you see is our water dispenser. 
The rectangle below that is actually a small oven we have on board to heat our food. So like I said, some food is freeze dried, some is not, but I cannot find my cursor. So let me see if I can do, there we go. Let's do this. All right. How many of you all like macaroni and cheese? Does your macaroni and cheese look like this? More importantly, does it sound like this? This is a package of freeze-dried macaroni. Yes, it is a solid block. So if I want to have some macaroni and cheese for dinner or for lunch, I'm going to float over to that water dispenser. There's a long needle that goes through that plastic part. I put water in. Probably in this case, I'm going to put four ounces of hot water. I'm going to let the hot water soak in. Probably will throw it in the oven as well. Then I'm going to take it out and I'm going to mush it around, make sure the water really got in there. And then I'm going to take my scissors and cut around the corner, peel it back, and then I can start eating my macaroni and cheese. So not bad. You see all the blue dots on the back? That's Velcro. I don't want my macaroni and cheese to float away because if I let go, it will float away. And then one of my crew members might grab it and eat it from his or herself. So I have Velcro, I can Velcro it to the locker. Now, did you have certain things you wanted to eat? Uh, astronaut Don Thomas said that he really loved kind of some mango juice or something like that. Did you have anything that you always requested? Yes, there are some things. It's interesting, before you fly, you will go over to the food laboratory at the Johnson Space Center. There are a group of people over there. It's their job to design space food. And you get to sample virtually everything they've come up with. And you get to have a little checklist and rate to yourself. You're like, ooh, macaroni and cheese. I give that a 10. Crawfish étouffé. Ooh, I give that a one. <laughs> I don't want that. And you taste all the food. But then, remember before I said you get up into space and you can't smell very well and you can't taste very well and your taste may change a little bit. So something that you really liked on earth, you get up into space and go, oh, I don't want, I don't want to have it. I love coffee. I absolutely love coffee. I get up launch morning, I have my coffee. So I had a lot of coffee in my food locker. There's a bag of black coffee. I got up into orbit and thought, I don't want coffee. It just sounds bad to me. I don't want to have to drink my coffee through a straw. I mean, I want, I want a cup of coffee. I want to be able to smell my coffee because that's what makes coffee taste good, the smell as well. So I never had coffee in space. So after that, after my first flight, I never put coffee on my menu. So yes, there's some things you really, really like. I love the shrimp cocktail. Um, my last flight, we had chicken enchiladas. That became one of my favorite dinners. I didn't have enough of them because I didn't know I was going to really like it. Um, my, one of my favorite drinks on orbit actually was grapefruit drink. Huh. Because I wanted something that was really tangy again, because I the other drinks I couldn't taste very well. The lemonade didn't taste very lemony to me, but the grapefruit drink was something that actually had some taste. And then I found I really liked the apple cider as well because it had a good taste. Well, we've heard from several astronauts that shrimp cocktail must be one of the very faves, but we've got a question from Facebook that says, what does it smell like on the ISS? I mean, I guess if you can't smell that great, do, do you have a sense of smell of what it smells like? Or is it just Actually, metal? Um, there are good things and bad things about being able to smell or not. Space Station <laughs> actually smelled pretty good because it was such a big spacecraft. Space Shuttle orbiters, on the other hand, eh, not so much. Because remember, I said we have to exercise. Now think about what happens when you're exercise. You sweat. We still sweat in space. Your things that you work out in, you exercise in, that clothing tends to smell a little bit, right? So imagine you have to collect all that clothing. And we had big laundry bags. All of that stays in the airlock with you. So there were many times that I was happy I could not smell very well. Because I have been told <laughs> by people who meet your spacecraft after landing that sometimes it smelled like the gym, the locker room at the gym. It didn't really smell all that good. But the space station actually was very clean, a very, very clean spacecraft and a big spacecraft. And therefore, it smelled pretty good. Excellent. Uh, let's see. This 
is a different type of macaroni and cheese. So some of the food has been prepared in a way where we don't have to refrigerate it. People in the military call these meals ready to eat, MRE. Basically, it's the same thing. Food that we don't have to refrigerate. So this is easier for me to eat because all I have to do is throw this in the oven, get it hot, and then I can just cut the top, peel it back, and I can have my macaroni and cheese. Or I can have my chicken with corn and black beans, if you like Mexican-type food. Pretty good. How many of you like sausage patties for breakfast? Again, freeze-dried sausage patty. I got to add water to it. Got to heat it up. Not bad. And then we do like our desserts. Shortbread cookies. So literally, we'll go to the grocery store and get snacks. We have, I do like trail mix. You can have trail mix that you can eat. So pretty good. Now, do you have to be careful that and clean up in case any of that trail mix or the little crumbs go flying and flitting away somewhere? Yes, because anything that does not get in your mouth will float and it will continue to float until it either gets sucked over to the filter where you can vacuum it up or you clean it up yourself. So oftentimes I'm asked, do you fly bread? What if you wanted to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Do we fly bread? No, because bread tends to make a lot of crumbs. We don't tend to fly crackers either because crackers make a lot of crumbs. So a favorite item is um, tortillas. I would think they would crumble as much as a cracker, but I guess not so much, huh? Uh, the uh, flour tortillas don't tend to make as many crumbs as a piece of bread or a cracker. Wow. That's why it wasn't one of Peggy Whitson's favorite things, something they called her uh she had like a nickname for this tortilla thing that she would make for the crew i'll have to google that but that's pretty funny yeah the tortillas are pretty popular uh, you know breakfast tacos breakfast burritos yes i actually if my favorite lunch on orbit i would take peanut butter and jelly and put it on my tortilla aha uh -huh. because i really like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and that is the closest i could get to a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in space I love it. I love it. Do you want to go back to your slides and show us yeah. what? Let's let's do this one. Because I'm seeing a lot of great questions and I want the kiddos to ask you those in a minute. All right. So again, no, I lost. Let's see. Well, let's go back. So you can see peanut butter. Yes, we are allowed to fly jars of peanut butter and jelly. My favorite dessert, peanut M&Ms because they float oh. around, it's fun to play with them. But this leads to a discussion of another type of research that we're doing on the space station, which is we're trying to figure out how to grow plants. Here you can see a couple of astronauts on the station, a very happy day for them because they had and a I'm recent- I'm so sorry, we do not see your screen for some reason. Uh, all right, let me, let's see. I don't know if Wade, you can help with that for a moment. All right, let's do that. Let's do that. Let me. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, I need an assist again. All right, can you, hey, Wade, can you help with yes. her screen? Yes, ma'am, I am, uh, I am there, Wendy, can with you. Drive. So you would like to give me uh, just to prove uh, control, I will help you out. Go for it. I'm not. And a couple of the other questions while Wade helps you get that uh, slide uh, show back up there. Uh, what happens if you have allergies and you want to be an astronaut? That's a good question, and I think it really depends on the type of allergies that you have. The doctors at NASA work very, very hard to keep you healthy, and so even before you, as you're going through the interview process to potentially become an astronaut candidate, you have to go through a lot of medical tests. You have to tell them what your medical history is, so 
I don't think that each and every type of allergy may be something that would keep you from being an astronaut. I think it, they just have to look at whether or not you've been able to control it with medicine and, and it improves in time. I had a roommate at the Naval Academy who was tested for 48 items and was allergic to 40, but she still served for over 20 years in the United States Navy because they found some medicine that helped her manage her symptoms. Wow. Okay. Ms. Lawrence, you should see an approval for... Yeah. All right, so let's see. Is that working? Perfect. All right, there's the peanut butter in space. Like I said, I love M&Ms. And fresh fruits and vegetables in space. Big deal particularly for the station crew members, because there's no food refrigerator on board. So they have to wait until another spaceship comes and docks. So getting fresh fruits and vegetables, very special for them. So uh, can you still see the screen? Right. Apologize, it looks like we are having a little bit of technical difficulty. So let's do that again. Um, and I'm gonna just not push any buttons. <laughs> All right, well, let me... Try that. Make sure that. All right. That. Okay. Play for current. There we go. And she is all yours. So we're trying to grow plants in space because we want to see if the crew can grow any of their own food. So we've been doing that for years now. Plants do grow a little bit differently in space. The plant senses that the leaves are already floating on their own. So if you compare the stem of a plant in space to the same plant on earth, the stem of the plant on earth is gonna be thicker and it's gonna be stronger. Because again, the plant in space knows, hey, I don't have to hold up the leaves. They're kind of floating on their own. So we've figured out better ways to get water to the plant and what sort of light they need. So now the crews can grow some lettuce and some cabbage and they say, it's really fun to be able to go over and pick some leaves and have their own fresh salad for dinner. Uh, but we wanna answer this question because eventually we'll send people back to the moon and we'll send people on to Mars. And we need to know if we can take plants from earth, put them in a different level of gravity and have them produce food month after month, hopefully year after year. So that's a fun type of research for the crews to do. All right. We have some robots on the space station. Again, when we go back to the moon and on to Mars, we're gonna send humans and robots together because they work well together. What humans are good at, solving problems, being creative to solve those problems, robots necessarily aren't good at. They're can, you know, their abilities are based on how well you design their computer programming. But robots are very strong. They can go in environments that humans can't. So we'll pair them together. Crew's gonna to have to be able to figure out how to do things on their own, like fix their own equipment. So we're working with 3D printers on the space station. We're figuring out how to do that. And again, eventually we'll take all this knowledge. You all will get to do this much more than I will. Eventually we'll go to the moon. We'll set up some uh, bases there, some habitats. But the goal is to do what we did during the Apollo program and eventually put a human on the surface of Mars, let them put their brute print in the Martian soil and see Mars with their own eyes and be explorers. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to share with you all. Well, I we have got a really great good questions and I suspect there are a few more. There are a lot of questions. And so guys, just get a view of these, um, you know, as those Martian images, you guys are the Artemis generation, the Mars generation. So I'm gonna put it here in our gallery view. I know you guys have some questions. So I'm gonna come around and let you ask those. So uh, Jesse, I see your hand up. What, were, what was your question, my dear? Oh, I didn't have a question, I was just, Fixing something on my, on my. Screen. Oh, okay. Evie and Maggie, did you guys have a question or several questions there? Um, uh, how like how do you water the plants? Um. Also, uh, how do you um? What was what went faster? Um, exiting the atmosphere or entering the atmosphere? By design, entering the atmosphere takes longer because we 
we have a very powerful rocket that gets us up through the atmosphere very, very quickly. Returning back to Earth, it's the way we design that is we start to slow the spacecraft down and over like a half 30 minutes to an hour or so, we let gravity eventually pull the spacecraft back down to Earth. Because if you start going too slowly, gravity will now win and it pulls you back to Earth. So we want that to be a slower process, mainly because we as humans, we haven't been in gravity for a long time. So we're not as used to it. We forget what it feels like. So that's to protect the crew as we come back to Earth. We want return to take longer. So we gradually build back up to the level of gravity rather than having to experience it all at once. So the way we water plants in space is a little bit different because you're right, I can't take my watering can and I can't pour it. The water will float up here. So we have a watering system that literally it just kind of puts the water directly into the soil surrounding the plant. But that was one of the things the engineers had to figure out. How do you water a plant in space? I don't have gravity to help me, so I have to have a different way of doing it. So think sort of like a drip irrigation system where the nozzle's right next to the surface of the soil. That's similar to what they do up in space. Great questions, ladies. All right, Judah, what's your question, sir? How, like, how roomy is the International Space Station? How roomy is it? The volume on the inside is about the same as a house that's almost 3,000 square feet. If you've ever been inside a 747 aircraft or seen a 747, it's the same amount of room that you have inside of that aircraft. And that's one of the world's biggest aircraft. So very roomy, very spacious, very fun to fly around on the inside. Awesome. All right, Dharma, I want you to talk to astronaut Wendy. She wants to be a pilot. She wants to be an astronaut. Do you have a question for her, my dear? Uh, yes. What was one thing that you missed on Earth while Ice you were cream. in space? <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> uh, I'll let you in a little secret. We do not fly the freeze-dried ice cream because most astronauts don't really think it tastes good. I guess you could call us a little snobbish, but we want the real deal. We want real ice cream. I do like ice cream quite a bit and um, never on any of my flights did we have actual ice cream. One flight had a freezer that we could turn on after we got to space. So if you've ever seen the uh, uh, Kool-Aid uh, freeze pops, we flew those. <laughs> That was a nice treat, but I miss ice cream. Did you want to ask her anything about becoming a pilot? Uh, yes. What was the hardest part about becoming a pilot? You know, it's like learning anything new. There are new words to learn. You know, everything you do, if you play sports and play music, each of those activities kind of have their own language, their own vocabulary. So you have to learn that. Um, and then flying, a lot goes on and you have to get better at kind of processing all these different sensory inputs. Um, imagine, remember back when you were trying to learn how to ride a bike, it seemed overwhelming because you had to steer, you had to pedal, you had to try and maintain your balance and learn how to do all those things at once. It took time. That's what flying's like. You've got to fly, you have to listen to communication on the radio, you have to pay attention to where you're going. We call that navigation. You have to monitor how well the aircraft is performing. All that is your engine working? Is the oil at the right temperature? Is it at the right level? So that just takes time. Your brain adapts and it gets better at processing that information. Fantastic. So like any activity to get good at it, you have to practice and it will take time. And Jesse had a question that he wrote down. I'm going back and looking through that. He wanted to know if you lost a tooth in space, would that, would the blood kind of also clump into a little sphere? Uh, we have had people who've cut themselves on orbit. And you're right, the blood behaves differently. So you saw the blob of water. That's what will happen when you bleed. You'll get, say you cut your finger, you'll get a blob on your finger and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger until you either wrap it in a bandage, put a bandaid around it. But yes, there's nothing to pull the blood to the floor anymore. So it will just get bigger and bigger in size until you stop the bleeding. 
And, and this is one of those things where really we do have to consider these most human factors of breaking a bone, losing a tooth, getting a bleed, something like that, of figuring out how to even uh, do medicine in space is a big yes. question. Amy Nelson over here, do you have a question for me, my dear? Did you have a question over there with Amy? Have Just you ever ate a donut in space? Oh, have you ever had a donut in space? I've not personally. None of my missions have had a donut. Hmm, that's a good question. But sounds like something you should add. All right, let me- Off the top of my head, I don't know if we've ever had donuts. We have had requests from on the space station crews for popcorn. Oh. They, 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 had, they really wanted some popcorn. So we flew them bags of popcorn. But I don't know about donuts. That's a good question. All right, Lynn Gal, what's your question? Um, so what was the worst food accident in space? And also, how do you brush your teeth in space? Oh, great food accident. <laughs> oh, this happened on one of my missions. <laughs> one of my crewmates wanted mushroom soup. So it was in a plastic pouch. Basically, you know, remember if you ever got the bags of cup of the bags of soup where you put it in, you added hot water because it was basically in powdered form. So was the mushroom soup. So we went over to the water dispensary, did everything we're supposed to do, slid the needle in, dialed up, you know, four ounces of hot water, pushed the button. Now we were told during our training flow that every so often the water dispenser would literally lose its mind and it wouldn't function correctly it may forget to turn itself off. So that's why they always told us, no matter how many times it works, always watch what's going on. Because you never know, that might be the one time where it literally keeps dispensing water. <laughs> well, it just so happened that this is the one time that this crew member decides not to pay attention. So nobody on the crew realized it, but the plastic bag of mushroom soup is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, I was up on the flight deck, but all of a sudden I heard this. And I looked down, there was a little opening between the upstairs flight deck and the downstairs mid deck. And I could see blobs of mushroom soup going everywhere. Oh, kind of like an explosion in space. It went everywhere. It covered all the walls downstairs. It took a long time to clean it up. And so that was not, not very pleasant. Whoa. What was the second question again? Yeah, Lynn Gal, what was your other question? It was, how do you brush your teeth? In how do you brush your teeth? Yes, it's a good question. So there's no sink on board. So before you fly, you do have a very important decision to make about brushing your teeth. And it is simply this. Are you gonna be a spitter or a swallower? Because again, no gravity to make it kind of fall, come out of your mouth and fall in the sink. So you have to decide if, do I like the taste of my toothpaste enough that I'm, I'll brush my teeth and just swallow? Or do I want to spit it out in a Kleenex? Otherwise, it works the same way. Toothbrush, wet it, put your toothpaste on, brush your teeth, and then you have to decide what you want to do with the toothpaste in your mouth. I always spit mine into a Kleenex. Yeah. But some people do swallow it. I would, I would have to have some really good peppermint uh, yes. toothpaste, I think, to swallow that. You All might right. get after six months, you may not still swallow your toothpaste. That's true. That's true. Maggie, what's your question, hon? Um, what was your favorite mission and why? Oh, see, that's a really hard question to answer because we spend so much time training. Let's see. I spent 50 days in space. And when you add up all the training for my missions, it was probably for my four missions, you probably, I have probably had four years of training. So we look forward to each and every one of our missions. I had fun on each one of my flights. I typically flew with different people. So each one of my missions is very, very special to me. And I'm not sure that I have one that I would necessarily call a favorite. Let me ask you this. Somebody saw, I was just reading a question from online. You actually flew after the Columbia disaster. Now you were, a, you got into the uh, astronaut candidate program after Challenger, but Correct. you flew after the Columbia. 
talk to us a little bit about that. I think they're just asking the question, did that make you any more fearful or was it just, that's the risk of getting to do something I've dreamt of doing? To a large degree, we understand that no matter how hard we work, flying in space is always gonna have risk associated with it. I mean, think about what you have to do. You have to design a very powerful rocket to work against gravity to get you up into space to operate in an environment that's very unforgiving. So yes, things can go wrong. That's one of the reasons why our training flow is so long. We spend most of our time practicing what to do in case we have a problem on board. We always want to be prepared for that situation. So yes, my last mission, STS-114, was the first what we called shuttle return to flight mission. It was basically a test flight. We had to do things differently once we got up into space. We had to have a way to inspect our spaceship. We had to have a way to repair our spaceship. These are things that we'd never had to do before. So we were had to develop those methods and then had to see how well they worked once we were operating in space. I have to give a lot of credit to a gentleman by the name of Wayne Hale, who became the shuttle program manager during most of the time that we spent trying to figure out how to return to flight. And he made a decision that he was going to include our crew in most of the meetings and most of the decision-making process. We, the crew, physically couldn't be there because we were training, but he always allowed us to have representatives there. And, and every month he took us, um, brought us into his office and closed the door. And we sat there for about an hour and he said, tell me how we're doing. What's not making you comfortable? What are you still uncertain about? What are your concerns? What would you like to see us do differently? So he was determined that we would not fly until we, the crew, were comfortable with every decision that NASA had made in terms of how we were gonna safely fly the space shuttle again. So because of that, no, I can say I was not nervous when I strapped on board, climbed on board Discovery to blast off into space for that last mission. All right, Lucas and Lynn Gao. I'm gonna come over here to Lynn Gao. What's your question, my sweet? Huh. I think I've lost you. Filter your pee. Huh? Oh. Do oh. you actually filter your pee? Filter your pee and then drink it? Do you, is that true? <laughs> yes, on board the International Space Station, that is absolutely correct. They, their urine goes into a big container. They take it over to a piece of equipment that can clean it and turn it into drinking water. And trust me, when we eventually go to Mars, live on the moon and live on Mars, we're gonna to have to do the very same thing. It's too hard for us to always send you water from Earth. That takes too many rockets. So we call that, um, we basically recycle the urine back into drinking water. It's a part of the life support system. And we're trying to develop life support systems that are, don't always have to re rely on things coming from Earth to make them work. Great question and probably a different answer than you may have been expecting. Lucas, my dear, what is your question? It is, what does the toilet bowl look like on the International Space Station? <laughs> that, was it the toilet? Uh -huh. What does it look like? Oh, well, let us go back to sharing the screen. Okay. And we can. All right, give me a moment. Oh, there we go. All right, that's the toilet. Well, this is the toilet that was install installed on the space shuttle orbiters. The space station toilet is not all that different. So I think you can recognize the toilet seat. So I showed you the blob of water, right? Everything floats. No gravity to help you. Think about how you would go to the bathroom differently up in space if you did not have gravity, right? We use suction. Think of your vacuum cleaner. It creates suction basically, which is a current of air that's strong enough to capture something and move it from one place to the next. So for the liquid waste and the solid waste, we create that strong flow of air to carry it away from the body. And then we basically store it in, in big containers, except on the International Space Station, that container then gets 
turn back into your drinking water. Wow. Wow. All right, you guys, it's like we're at about time to, it's like, are there any last things? Let me see. I want to check the, the chat over here, make sure I haven't missed anybody's question. Any last things that you want to ask before? Uh, that was a question that we did get from Facebook about, can you pop popcorn in space or with, I, I, you mentioned popcorn, but would you have to just send it already pre-packaged? I don't think anybody has ever tried to pop it because I don't think we've ever had the right equipment to do that. Um, I suspect you could, but we'd have to think about how we would design the piece of equipment to pop the popcorn. It's, it's not going to taste as good, but it's just easier to send it from Earth. Gotcha. All right, Andrew, I saw your chat. All right, and what's your question, sir? Um, what was sort of like the most disturbing thing that's happened in one of your space flights? Well, I wouldn't call it necessarily um, disturbing, mainly because I suspected it was going to happen. And as we practice this in our simulator on Earth, I kept asking Mission Control whether they really, really, really wanted me to do it this way. And they said, oh, it'll be fine. Trust us, it'll be fine. So on my last mission, we did a spacewalk to replace something that's called a control moment gyro. It keeps the space station in the correct position. I was flying the space station robotic arm and I had to put something that weighed 20,000 pounds back into the payload bay of the space shuttle orbiter. And I had concerns about the arm being fully stretched out because that was gonna be 55 feet with 20,000 pounds on the end, a lot of weight flying at a fast speed. I said, I think that might be too much for the control moment gyros to handle, particularly since You've just had to put a new one into the process we use to control the position. They kept saying, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. So I get to that point where I'm about to move the speed of the arm up, move to that faster speed. And I, one more time, ask mission control, are you sure this is going to be okay? <laughs> yes, go right ahead. So I did. And there goes the arm, it's flying fast, fully stretched out, and I start reading the message lines from the space station computers that say, control moment gyros near saturation. And I think to myself, that is not a good message to have right now. And then a moment later, all the alarms go off. And I see this message that says, station loss of attitude control. And I say, well, that's really not a good message to have right now. <laughs> and I immediately had to stop the robotic arm. And so it wasn't that disturbing because I suspected this was gonna happen. That's why I asked mission control one more time. Um, they were very apologetic. They knew that they had been wrong. And uh, they told me that, don't worry, we'll fix our mistake. You can go off and do something for 20 minutes until we fix our mistake and then we can come back and finish. So that's probably the most exciting moment I had. It was a little bit of a I told you so moment. So I'm glad I thought of it in advance. Again, that's why we practice so much on the ground so we can think of these things and be prepared for them. All right, we're gonna end with your question here, Lynn Gal. What's your question, guys? Uh, we wanted to know, what did the, ast uh, what did the uh, robots do in the space station? Like there was a robot that looked like a human. What is yeah, it? so we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to pair the robot with the human. So the one that looked like a human is called Robonaut R2 for short. Uh, we're trying to see if we can program uh, Robonaut to do some basic activities like go over and throw, um, maybe th throw a few switches for the crew member. Most everything on the space station's computer controlled, so that may not work out. The free-flying ones that, you, that have big cameras, we're thinking we could use those to do inspections so they could fly around and videotape the inside of the space station. Oftentimes the crew will take pictures for people on the ground to see so they can see what the condition of the inside of the space station is, same for the outside. If we could have a robot do that instead, that saves the crew hours each week having to do that, what we call photo documentation instead. So we're, we're still at the early stages of trying to figure out what type of robot will work best with a human, what activities will be best for the robot to do. So 
a lot of this is just a big experiment. Well, last, I think it's like, we're gonna leave this with you, Wendy, to kind of take us out of here for the day. But any last, I mean, what you said to me is the quote of the week about if you have a dream, you must do all that you possibly can to be true to yourself to make sure that dream is achieved. Do you have any last things about the best ways to become an astronaut or to even be the best ways in life to be astronaut minded? Well, I like to say dare to dream because I think it all starts with you giving yourself permission to dream the dream and then work hard, being willing to work hard to pursue it. So it's not going to be easy. I'll be honest with you. It takes a long time. And yes, it's okay to have doubts about whether or not you can make it come true. But what I really want you to take away is that it's okay to ask for help. In fact, that is a very smart thing to do. Nobody can be good at everything. You're going to have some things that in order for you to get better, you need to work at it. So you need to find somebody who's better and then ask them to help you. And those people, trust me, they are in your life and they want to help you. They want to help you be successful. They want to help you pursue your dream. Your parents, your teachers, even your older siblings, your coaches, people at your church, other activities that you're a part of. So never, never, ever think it is a bad thing to ask for help. That is a very smart thing to do. Well, we cannot thank you enough. What a fantastic, fantastic session this has been. I'm going to unmute you guys and we're all going to say thank you, astronaut Wendy. You're thank, very you. thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Tomorrow morning. Bye. Wendy, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. <sighs> you too. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you Bye. in the morning. Bye. 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 Thank you, Wendy. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Right now. Everybody be safe. Stay healthy. That's loud. Live long and proper. <laughs>